Welcome to Uncomfortable is OK. I'm joined today by Kane Briscoe. Kane is, he's a dad, he's a farmer from the Naki. He is a dude who's, who's trying to in, inspire a whole lot of others. He's the founder of FarmFit and he's a recently published author as well of the book Tools from the Top Paddock. Kane, it's, it's awesome to have you here, mate. Welcome. No, nah, thanks for having me, mate. It's a pleasure to be here as always. And yeah, I love having these good conversations and like, yeah, getting a, a deeper conversation than you can on, on some of the other interviews I've done lately. <laughs> well, we haven't, we haven't finished yet. So let's, uh, let's win. <laughs> okay. And I always like to start off, mate, like, where are you, where, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Yeah, so I actually grew up in a little town just out of New Plymouth called Bell Block. So I was actually a, a, a townie by birth. But well, actually, to be fair, I was, I was born in another little town, Waitara, which has got an interesting reputation, I guess, a little bit of a tougher town. But we moved to Bell Block when I was just before I was five. And which was an yeah, awesome little town, awesome upbringing. I lived probably 200 meters away from the from the school, the school I went to. So, and yeah, had a had a blast. I think it was the last... Growing up in the nineties was the last good generation where you could just, you know, it was basically get home before dark or else. And, and, you know, the parents left me to it and, you know, the town was my jungle, so to speak, but yeah, pretty lucky that I had an uncle that was a farmer on my mum's side. They, they, she was from a farming background and me and my two older brothers got shipped out there a lot uh, in the weekends and school holidays while mum and dad had a break or, or worked, they're pretty hard workers. So me and my brother sort of grew up. Grew up with the best of both worlds, really. It was a bit of town and a bit of country, and we all we all ended up falling in love with the the farming lifestyle and the work, and that yeah, developed pretty pretty intense love for it from a pretty young age. And for most of my life, it's really all I wanted to do. So left left school at the age of seventeen and and started the old farming journey down in South Taranaki, and pretty much lived there for seventeen years, half my life. And I've recently just changed farms and I've moved up closer to New Plymouth again. So um, yeah, just been four months up here, I think. So I haven't lived up in North Taranaki for yeah, 17 years now. So it's a bit of a change. I'm, I'm about 20 minutes drive from New Plymouth. So I'm pretty close to the You're basically close a to townie, town. mate. Basically a fucking townie <laughs> now, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, yeah, definitely a bit, bit different. Yeah, it's quite, quite strange. I never thought I'd live half my life in, in South Taranaki, to be honest. It was, it was the last place I thought I'd end up, but I yeah, thoroughly enjoyed my time down there. And yeah. Where did you think we you are. were going to end up? I thought I'd stay in Bell Block, mate, or around it. I thought I'd be a farmer just, just around Bell Block. But to be honest, as a teenager, I didn't really think about the future too much. I was, I was pretty, pretty happy just living day by day to be fair. And, yeah. and. You know, I, I left school without a, without a plan at all. I, I actually didn't want to be a dairy farmer at that stage because I was a teenager and I didn't like getting up at 4am. So I, I went, used to go and do a bit of work for my brothers during the school holidays, but as a job, I was like, oh, geez, I don't know if I can do that, you know? And I left school and mum and dad were like, well, you got to get a job now. What are you going to do? And I was like, I've got no idea. I was just planning on kicking the breeze a little bit for a while with mum and dad. And they're like, oh, well, you're not living here for free. So they, they shipped me off to my brother, who was a, who was a share milker down at, just outside a little town called Partia, which is another, another little town in Taranaki with a bit of a reputation, pretty hard sort of town, old freezing works town. And, um. I never thought I'd end up there of all places. My, my mates were like, what are you going down there for? You know, it's <laughs> what the hell, but yeah, they ended up living around there for seven years, I think, and, and farming and, and just, I had a few, few opportunities that I took really early on and, and I just, I wanted to make a, I wanted to prove th some things, I think, to, to people that, you know, I wasn't a no hoper and I wasn't a dumbass, and I, I had my two brothers that were pretty successful. They were quite a bit older than me, pretty successful in farming. And I, I sort of just wanted to make them proud of me and make my dad proud of me. But yeah, I wanted to prove people wrong too. So I, I threw myself into, into farming, like just working like a dog and learning as much as I could and just taking opportunities when they arose and, and had a pretty, I'd say pretty rapid rise to a high level in dairy farming to in the end. And yeah, it was, I don't know. I just, I I'd never thought about it when I was a teenager. I, I, I had a feeling I'd be a farmer. It was either farming or the army, one of those two. And yeah, went down the farming route and yeah, never looked back really. Yeah. Awesome, bro. Let's talk about feeling like a no-hoper and, and <laughs> wanting to prove people wrong, mate. Like that was, that was something that I picked up from your book. I was like, that's, that, that's really interesting. 
when did kind of that story start for you? That's a really good question. I, I, I can't, I can't pinpoint it because I think at that age, I didn't really understand it. It was just there. It was just a, uh, I actually didn't, didn't believe I had what it took to be a farmer. And, and that was probably why I was leaning away from it as a teenager. I think like I knew, you know, the, the people that farmed around me, my uncle and my brothers were, were very, that number eight wide Kiwi, they were, they were, they just, they seemed like they got it. They got everything about farming and everything they did was right. And whenever I went out on the farm, I just, I, I didn't feel like I understood it that well. And I'd, I'd do the wrong thing and I, I couldn't follow instructions that well. And I just felt bloody useless sometimes, you know, and like, I, I still loved the work, but I was always making these mistakes and I was like, damn, I'm never going to be, I just don't have it. You know, I just don't get it. And I was just comparing myself to, you know, my brothers were nine and 11 years older than me. And obviously my uncle had been farming all his life. And I, I was comparing, you know, me as a 12 year old to, you know, my brothers who were in their twenties, you know, that they were full-time farming and they'd been doing it for a few years, but I just, I can't pinpoint what it was, but I just had a, I had a, I think it was probably actually when I, when I, when I actually first started farming it wasn't till I actually got out and got that first job and I was I, I just had this burning desire to not be a failure number one but but not be average at it either I was like you know I'm going to prove these I'm going to prove that I can do it and I, I I don't know what it was it was just it was probably resentment and anger to be honest I, I think that's probably what it was I was just pissed off I was I was pissed off with them for thinking that maybe and, and pissed off with myself for being that and I was like I'd, I don't want to be that guy that's shit house. I mean, you know, I, 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 I've got to find a way to, to get whatever it is. I, I've got to, you know, I just, I just worked really hard at getting farming for, for lack of a better word. And yeah, you know, I just, I just worked my ass off and just became a sponge for information. And back then, like, you know, it was still the old dial up internet, you know, there wasn't, wasn't, I don't know if, I don't, I don't think Facebook was out yet. You know, it was still, I don't know, you might be. I don't know what your age is. How old are you, Chris? I will be 39 next month. So oh, a couple yeah. Of so years, a couple of years on you. Yeah. Yeah. You'd remember like MSN chat. I think. Oh yeah. Bebo. Yeah. And Bebo. Bebo. That was it. You know, that was our life. I think YouTube was, there was a few YouTube videos starting up. Yeah, MySpace. Know? MySpace. Yeah. Yeah. So there wasn't, there wasn't heaps of information out there and, and having rural internet, that wasn't really a, a way you could get it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So it was, it was reading books. It was listening to other farmers and, and, um, you know, I got a lot out of, if I did get the internet to work, it was like the only thing I could sort of find on Google was like research papers for dairy farming and nutrition and, and pastures and that sort of thing, which was, so I started like devouring them and trying to understand research papers, which is quite difficult for an 18 year old that's, you know, I, I, I didn't pass, you know, I didn't do seventh form, you know, I was, I was a sixth form sort of. Especially if you haven't, basically. if you haven't had anyone talk to you about kind of, this is, nah. this is what scientific papers are about. Here's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, here's, <laughs> here's the aim of them. <laughs> yeah. So it was, I was literally reading these, you know, a lot of them were American too, these research papers and just trying to pick up tidbits of information to, to try and understand animals and how they worked and, and grass and how to grow it and, and all this sort of shit. And it was, it was bloody challenging, mate, but I was, I just had this burning desire to be better than average and, and probably, probably wanted to be better than my brothers in all honesty, you know, they were my, I saw them as competition and I was like, fuck you, I'm going to, I'm going to be better than you, you watch sort of thing. And I'm going to make something of myself and I, I can't pinpoint what it is, but yeah, probably, probably a lot of it just came from pain, you know, just. Mm. I, I found a way to use pain as a motivation. I, I, you know, you get two options, I guess you can either let it, let pain drag you down or you can, you can let it push you forward. And I'm incredibly thankful that I found a way to, to get it to push me forward most of the time anyway. Yeah. 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 Have there been some times that it, that it hasn't pushed you forward, that it's dragged you down? Oh, absolutely, mate. I, that's the nat natural inclination. I think, you know, I was, I was actually talking to my, my my farm worker today about it you know it's our first thoughts and about anything are generally negative you know you know we just automatically go to that you know we have this negative the first frame of mind the first mindset is 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 generally negative and we've got to catch it and, and turn it around so with anything i still 
I still get that now, you know. So yeah, I've definitely let it drag me down. Probably uh, what would it be now? I've had probably you know ups and downs in life, but yeah, probably as a late teenager, I, I struggled with with a lot of it, a lot of things that had happened, and and then again, probably in my early twenties. Had a, had a bit of a struggle and sort of ran away overseas, <laughs> as yeah. as us do, and and had an OE and and mastered over with a bit of with a bit of piss drinking and good times. And then again, you know, when I when I went into dairy farming really seriously uh, and and had a lot of financial pressure, I let it drag me down too. And you know, I look I look back and really thankful that I've been able to be aware enough, I think, to learn the lessons from it and and understand that that's part of what life is, is, is going up and down, you know, and, and traversing the bloody, I've always sort of thought of life as like traversing the Andes, you know, all the Himalayas, you know, it's just mountain peak after valley after mountain peak. And that's sort of how I've come to view life really is you, you need those valleys to make the mountains. Um, yeah. if you don't have, you know, you, you can't stay on the top of Everest forever. You just die, you know, and it's, I was talking to someone about it the other day, actually, like, what do you, what does someone think when they get to the top of Mount Everest, you know, cause it's, and it, it, we sort of get that after big achievements in my life. I know I've certainly had a few, you, you get there and achieve something and you're like, oh, that was awesome. And then you have this depression afterwards mm. and it's sort of like, you know, coming down off the mountain and it's, yes. it's, it's, it's learning to, you know, take the lessons out of the valleys and enjoy the journey up the mountain is the most important thing. Yeah. yeah. I've actually, I've talked to a couple of dudes, had a couple of dudes on the podcast who have climbed Everest Wow. and they, yeah. uh, to like steal your metaphor there, they, they're like, actually, we don't, we don't start getting excited until we get down as well. Cause when yeah, you're, we are, yeah. yeah, when you're there, you're, you're up and like, it's cool. But you can't really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. So you got to get yeah. down otherwise. Yeah, yeah. You're in trouble. And, and the guy, one of the guys, is like, "There's not much oxygen up there, so you can take your mask off, get a quick selfie, bang it yeah. on, and then <laughs> file back down." He's like, "Yeah." So it's yeah. not a, it's it's not the most enjoyable experience being being there. His favorite parts were like, part of it is the part of it's the journey up, part of it is kind of being there, looking back and seeing how far I've come, but then also seeing the seeing the peak, yeah. and then part of it is the it's the way down. And again, yeah. kind of that, that spot at one of the, one of the landings there is like going back down. I'm feeling safer, but I can see like, I just summited that big fucker. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. But then again, yeah, it's like, it, it's that, that challenge, I guess, of kind of wrestling with like, man, I've done, I've just done something pretty cool. And now I'm in a bit of a valley. Like what is, yeah, 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 I think the human brain kind of goes to, I'm, I'm going to be stuck here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's the next mountain? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's, it's, we need those valleys to rest too. And we've got to appreciate that, that they're there for a reason. And, and we're talking about valleys and that, but you know, essentially it's the hard parts of your life or, or the, the times when you do get sucked down by depression or whatever it may be. And, you know, they're there to teach us something and I, I don't know why, and I don't know what it is, but. I've, I picked up on that lesson fairly early in life, I think, and, mm. and I'm fucking thankful I did, you know, because it's, it's, it's worth its weight in gold, that little nugget of, you know, it's shit when you're there, but if you can, if you can reframe it in your mind that I, I need to learn something here and, and this, this won't last forever, you know, it will pass, there will be another mountain to climb or whatever it may be, but. It's interesting that little thing, you know, when you have such a big purpose, whether it's running a race or climbing a mountain, whatever it may be, uh, this goal that you achieve it, all of a sudden that purpose goes when you, when you actually knock it off and it's, it shows you how important purpose is, I think. And that's, that's something being a, a real strong theme, I guess, throughout my life is, is or more so the last five to 10 years is, is really understanding my purpose and, and having a purpose every day, you know, so it's not necessarily a climbing an, an Everest but it's, it's something to get up to every morning and, and mm. start your day with intention has been so important for me because otherwise you, you just sort of mope around and you don't, you don't, I think particularly men, we need a direction, you know, a reason to yeah. roll out of the bed with a bit of, with a bit of pep in our step makes such a difference to life. It does. It does. And I think it's like, I, I've heard the metaphor that they've likened men to, to dogs. 
in a way. <laughs> dogs need something to do. Like if yeah, you leave a dog and they don't have anything to do, either they're going to go and lie in the corner and get really sad, or they're going to just chew the shit out of all your furniture. Yeah, so yeah. Either, you're, you're either destructive or you're or you're depressed if you don't have kind of something that you're working towards and something that you're working on. And like I'm interested. In, yeah, I, I think just just touching on that, like I've been a big believer in that we need problems, and yeah. for a lot of a long time, well, not a long time in my life, but a big chunk of my life, I tried to, I got to a point where I tried to avoid problems, like stress, you know, and it's quite interesting when we don't have problems, we create them just like the dog goes and chews the sofa. He knows he's going to probably get a kick up the ass, you know, and a telling off, but he's got nothing better to do. So he creates a problem. And I've definitely noticed that, you know, earlier on in my life, and I'm, and I'm sure we all do it, I'm sure we all do it. And, you know, when you don't have that purpose or, or good problems to solve, you go and create generally bad problems. And it's, it's been really interesting to be aware of that and then see that in other people. And you see it right throughout society, you know, I'm a big believer in, in getting yourself, if, you, if you're in a, a tough place, particularly mentally, I think if you're, if you're lacking purpose and that you need to find yourself some good problems to solve. Because that's what we like to do as humans. It's probably not something that gets talked about as a kid, you know. But, you know, it's essentially that's what we're really good at, you know. It used to be, I'm hungry, this is a problem, I need to solve this, you know. Or, or I'm cold, I need to need to fix that, you know, really basic stuff. But essentially our life is is dealing with problems and, and finding solutions for them. But it's it's what sort of problems do you want in your life? And it's it's a good idea to have good problems to solve rather than, you know, sinking a dozen a piss or, or snorting a line sort of thing. And <laughs> that leads to a whole, whole yeah. different sort of problems that, that, that don't go down a good hundred percent, mate. And I think like <laughs> few hundred, a uh, few hundred years ago, like that hungry and cold, they were big problems because if you oh, didn't yeah, solve man. them reasonably quickly, you were dead. Like, yeah, yeah, and they were hard, hard problems to solve. Yeah. you know, they yeah. were gen genuinely even even a hundred years ago, if you were a, mm. you know, lived in the bush or something, which wouldn't have been that uncommon in New Zealand, you know, you know, breaking in land and that, that sort of shit. It was it was a genuine big problem to solve, and you think about it now, it's it's a pretty easy problem to solve. You can yeah. you can literally get Bang. over eats and yeah yeah and then hit the hit the heat pump um, with the other hand yeah 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 or, or yeah. you do it at the same time then <laughs> <laughs> so if you're we're thinking kind of proactively solving problems and and kind of thinking about purpose and outside of like those big events and those big those big mountains that we we want to knock off like that that cool but they'll kind of one off purposes for us. And yeah, yeah. I, like, I think like what I see with a lot of people as well is that they, they hit that and it's done. And then they do, they slide kind of down towards a depression. I've had conversations mm. with a few people who have like, who have actually just followed that route exactly as you described it. But I think we also kind of, and I get the feeling that you do as well is that we get, need to have like that daily purpose as well. Is like, what is yeah. the, almost kind of like, what's the infinite problem that I'm trying yeah. to solve here? Like, what's this problem? Like, this is still going to be a problem, like even after I die, but yeah, it's like, I can take a good whack at it while I'm here yeah, yeah, totally. and, and feel and proud of doing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it is, it's really interesting because you, you talk about the, you know, the big things, climbing a mountain or running a marathon or whatever it may be. And they're important to do some of that shit in life, but you can't do that all the time. And it's, it's, it's I think it's totally a naturally natural thing to, you know, tick something like that off and, and get a bit depressed or empty afterwards. I think that's part of the process of just ticking off something, you know, something you thought you couldn't do or whatever. I think it's completely natural, but you know, you know, talking about daily life and purpose, it, I think it's really important to make those really bloody simple and, and that's certainly what I do. And so for me, it's, it's, I've got to work and I've, I've got a, you know, my personal life, I guess. And, you know, for me, my purpose is, is to to really now I, I was, you know, the, the dairy farm I was on previously, well, it was just me, it was a one man band. So it was all about, my purpose was to, to look after my cows and to, to produce high quality food for people and, and that, you know, as simple and as basic as that is, it's, it's, I, I attached a lot of meaning to that. So it was, it was really, 
you know, it was really motivating for me because I, I, I worked on create, you know, giving that a lot of leverage, I guess you could say. So when it was, you know, when you were tired and when it was raining outside, it was, uh, there was enough meaning behind those two simple things to get up and, and, and go. And then, you know, obviously in my personal life, it's been about being a better man so I can be a better, better father, you know, essentially is, is, you know, good fathers are good people, you know, good people make good fathers, sorry, I should say. So it's, it's, it's trying to, you know, work on the things I need to identify my weaknesses and, and what I'm not good at and, and sharpen the strength, so to speak. And, and, you know, so it starts every day being kind to myself, you know, taking a win from the day, understanding that I'm not perfect. So forgiving myself for when you do stuff it up, I think it's been hugely important for me. Do you have a Trying process to, yeah. that you, that you go through with that? Like I think as Kiwi dudes as well, and like, this is something that I mm. massively struggled with is that you hold that on, like you hold on oh. to that you, and you beat yourself up and you've got that little Absolutely. bastard that sits on your shoulder <laughs> and it's like, you're just a fucker. You don't, you don't deserve that. Like, yeah. And uh, it's taken me a while to get there, but like really interested in like practically how yeah, do you yeah, do yeah. that? Because when you start yeah, to do it, you kind of feel like you're lying to yourself. Yeah, it's like that, that little bastard's still on the shoulder, you know, that, that he never goes away, unfortunately, but yeah, yeah, you learn to deal with him. But yeah, it took me a, and I'm, I'm no, I'm certainly not, not optimal or anything at this, but something that was been hugely, hugely powerful and important for me. And I put it off for so many years because I just thought it, thought it was the bloody, this isn't, this isn't what guys do, but just writing shit down has been so cool for me and I, like I, I don't, I have kept journals and, and, and gone down that road, but I don't actually keep a journal anymore. I'll just find a scrap of paper and just brain dump shit, you know, and I've found what happens through that process is you tend to, I tend to like, I, I write out the good and the bad and you know, just whatever's on my mind, you know, the, the, the devil on your shoulder and the angel on the other one, sort of just write out whatever's going on in there. And, you know, whether I'm telling myself a shit story, like I'm useless or whatever, write it out. And yes, I sort of write, write it out and then see it for what it is. Mm. And it's like, oh, that's pretty fucking stupid, you know? And, and you, you write out your wins or what you did, you know, perp you know, you've got to be conscious, like, what did I actually do that was good as well? You know, and you know, you, you got to be honest with both, but you know, you, you sort of look at them both and. I don't know, there's something about when I write it out and see it, it takes a lot of that power away. The negative thoughts don't have so much power and you sort of, I sort of see it like, is that fact or fiction? And that's been as well, really important for me and, and how I problem solve as well, because I, when I write things out, I tend to write out the facts rather than the, the future, if that makes sense when I, yeah. when I problem solve. I mean, it, yeah, it's been the same for for that sort of personal stuff as well as just having a bit of a brain dump on a piece of paper and, and look, these days I don't even keep them anymore. It's just, it's just a, that's my process for, you know, I just seem to like in my head, I'll beat myself up and then I write it out and I'm like, oh, well, that's a bit silly. You know, why, why are you saying that about yourself? You, know, yeah. you, you wouldn't put that in a book. So why are you writing it? You know? <laughs> it, it yeah. just, it just, yeah, it just, there's something about it for me where that just clears things up a bit, you know, and, and, you know, you, it's, it's like having a pros and cons list almost. You can write mm. down your shit things you did and what you're beating yourself up about, and then you can, you can find some wins in the day. And there's always wins. There's, there's yep. always something to be thankful for, even on your worst bloody possible day, it, there's something to be grateful for. And also the other thing I did, I got off, it was Andrew Huberman, who I'm sure you're probably familiar with was uh, around I've gratitude. Yeah. Most people have that will be listening to this, I'm sure, but around that gratitude, no, I, I definitely started off with the, you know, write down three things you're grateful for every day. And, you know, you go through the list, the roof over your head and being alive and breathing and muscles and so I can do this and that and, and all the people in your life. And, and he, I listened to a video he did where it was a more powerful way was replaying a time you received gratitude or saw gratitude in an actual situation and reliving that story and telling yourself that story and your, your, how you felt receiving gratitude or being grateful or, or seeing, you know, bearing witness, you know, and, and, and the power of replaying that story in your mind. And that's been huge, man. Like that was, that what just took it to a whole, what does that give you? Like, how do you experience that when you do it? 
because you you relive those emotions mm. and the, those. But what feelings. are you? What are you feeling? As you do it. <laughs> Yeah, what am I feeling? That's that's a really good question. It's it's well, you, you feel grateful, like you feel you feel. I, I feel almost privileged. Like uh, the the situation in particular, I replay is is not as as me witnessing gratitude between other people, and you, you feel humbled and privileged and and love. I feel a lot of love when I, you know, and it's not even between me, but I feel love. You know, it's not like mm. I'm I'm feeling loved but I just feel love and love's a positive thing. You know, yeah. Usually anyway, but you know, to just to feel, to feel love's a really positive thing. And it's, it's, yeah, I've, I've found that super powerful, like hugely, like, yeah, because you can sort of just write out three things you're grateful for. And I, I believe it's a great start for anyone, mm. but you don't necessarily feel it. Yeah. You know, yeah. sometimes you just write it out for the sake of, you know, it's, it's, it's the, yeah. I've got to, the it's, dude it's, that picked my coffee obstacle. beans in Ecuador. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, and uh, you know it, it, it has some power. It can mm. if, if you if you think about it. If you if you sit down and purposely write it out and and actually spend a bit of time thinking about those three things, but often it becomes you just write out three things and carry. You're just ticking a box, eh? Yeah, ticking a box. So, but but the the power in reliving that story is you actually purposely have to sit down. And I started by writing out that story. And then, and then, you know, you read through it and it, it, it stops you from just being a box ticking and it, it stops you and makes you pay attention to that. And rather than just moving on to the next thing. And yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been a, a huge one for me. Yeah. That's a, that's a fucking great one actually. And like, as you were talking about it, one popped into my mind as well. And yep. I just, I don't know if you saw, I just kind of broke into this. Big yeah, yeah, yeah. It's when my kids met each other for the first time and yep. just the oldest one's reaction to the yep. youngest one Special stuff, was, man. was so awesome. And just kind of yeah. just thinking about that. And so that I might have to kind of put that on repeat for in the evenings yeah. of my life from, for the next wee while and have an experiment <laughs> with that. Get you through the tough times. Eh? And it's, it's, it's super cool. If you can, you know, go back to the emotions you felt and, and how that made you mm. feel and, and you feel those again, like, just like you did then you, you feel that moment again. And it's, it's not so much the moment, it's how you feel about it. And yeah. it's so powerful. <laughs> so cool. 10 years ago, mate, did you think that you would be sitting, having conversations with dudes about emotions? <laughs> absolutely not no, five neither. years ago i didn't <laughs> it's so weird man like honestly i sort of i sort of touch on it in the opening in the book but if i saw myself you know doing this shit i'd just be like what the hell you know like what are you up to you know yeah it's so weird so strange it's it's i never would have never would have imagined it but and in, in funnily enough writing the book it did made me think when I was a teenager I had a feeling that things I'd been through I would use maybe it was a desire maybe to to use that to help others yeah. I always had this feeling that I, it would play out somehow yeah uh, but what? never ever never ever thought I'd have the balls to do it I never knew how it would look or anything like that yeah what things are you talking about in particular? Probably the, the abuse when I was younger, I think was, would be the main one, but I, that probably, probably that. And when I, when I took up boxing as a 18 year old, I knew there was, I knew they were, there was a connection between the two. The boxing was a massive outlet and a, in a, in a mindset shift for me. And I, I knew those two moments in my life, I just had a feeling in the back of my head. I never ever told anyone cause I thought it was stupid, but I just. You know, it was one of those things that we, you'd, I don't even know if it was a dream or daydream, but it would just pop up that I'm going to be telling this story to other people or something like that, or, or, or I'll be, you know, there was just a feeling that it would, it would, those two moments were, and, but you know, even, even after the abuse as a teenager, I was like, had, had this feeling that I'll be, you know, using that to help other people. It's, it's quite a strange one. Mm. And it's quite been quite strange to actually see that play out. Yeah. Because that, it, it wasn't that intentional in, to be doing what I'm doing, you know, it's was, it was quite a, yeah. And it, it, I didn't really connect the dots probably ag again and, until I actually started writing the book was sort of when I remembered that and, and 
remember feeling that as a teenager and young adult, because I've probably forgotten about it a bit later mm. on in life. Yes. And so you were, you were having that feeling. Had you talked to anyone about the abuse that you'd been through no. when you were having that feeling? No, no, that's no. really, I didn't, I don't think I told anyone until I was about 18 or 19 that I'd been abused, not a, not a soul. And it was, it was only talking to someone else that had been abused. They opened up to me. And, and then I, then I shared as well with them. And I, that was the first time I told anyone. So it was, no, no one had any idea. I was, I was like, as a, as a kid and as a teenager, I was the shyest, quietest, you know, didn't, didn't speak unless I was spoken to sort of kid, you know? And so, so to be doing this sort of stuff's quite, quite a polar opposite really. Yeah. And were you, were you sh like, was that your personality before the abuse as well? Like we used that yeah, it was quiet yeah. kid as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. I was. I was. I was quite a quite a reserved, quiet kid, which is weird because my two older brothers, are, are, well, particularly my oldest one, he's loud and proud. You know, he was the he was the loudest one in a room, sort of thing. And you know, as a you know, when I was you know a young kid, he was sort of in his late teens and you know playing footy and getting out on the purse and going on the parties. And he'd he'd rock up to mum and dad's and he'd be yahooing. And you know he, he's one of those people that he knows he's just memorable. You know yeah. just his look and his and how he speaks and and his character. He's just you know he'd turn up to a party with a hundred people and everyone would remember him. You know he'd make himself known and that sort of thing. And and I was the opposite. I was shy as buggery. I was I was. Um, you know, pretty, pretty bloody quiet and reserved, particularly around anyone that was a little bit older than me. It was probably not too bad with, at school with, you know, my peers, probably not too bad. I was never the loudest in the class by any means, but anyone that was older than me, I just had the utmost respect for and was yeah really, really incredibly reserved around them right throughout life. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of people, uh, you know, family and that are really surprised that I'm doing what I'm doing. To be honest, it's, it's quite a shock. And even, even, you know, schoolmates I've had reach out from high school and, and primary school, like just pretty surprised. <laughs> yeah. In, in a positive way. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've had, I've had pretty much nothing but positive feedback. You know, they're like good on you, you know, and you know, who would have thought, you know, sort of comments, but you know, good on you. It's awesome what you're doing. So yeah, that's been, that's been pretty humbling because you, when you put yourself out there, I guess you definitely have those thoughts that oh, people are going to think I'm an idiot or a weirdo or, or, you know, they're not going to agree or not going to support it and that sort of thing. And it's probably no doubt there's some of that, but no one said it to my face. So it doesn't count mm. is, is my motto with that. So the day someone says it to my face, I'll, I'll listen to it and then I'll understand it. But yeah, I've had, I've had really good support for it and feedback and yeah, pretty humble by it, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. We should probably actually have a talk about it and oh, fun, fun <laughs> thing, what, yeah, what you're up to. Just a quick one, mate. I, I want to like come back to pain and talk about pain in a little yeah, bit yeah. Like, yeah, as well. And really, kind of, yep. uh, building a relationship with that. But mate, farm fit, like how did that come mm. about? Yes, yeah, so I guess sports, sport and training has been a big part of my life. I played rugby since the age of five and obviously boxing we touched on have been really important for me and, and teaching me some stuff about myself and, and on the quest to be a better human, they've played a really big part in teaching me, you know, some life lessons and I've been able to, you know, have some great experiences through, through sport, but I've also always made a connection that it's improved me as a person, but it's also improved me as a farmer as well in my, in my career. It's made me a better farmer because I've learned, learned and been able to apply things from sport into farming. Like a, just a quick example would be, would be breathing. So I, I learned how to breathe when I started boxing. I didn't never, ever paid attention to how I breathed during fitness or, or exercise or, or anything like that, but it's pretty crucial for, for combat that you understand how you're breathing and the correct way to do it. And so obviously applied that to my rugby and saw some benefits and, and, and that it calmed me down and I was able to think clearly. And the worst thing you can do in a boxing ring is get angry most of the time. So you've got to be able to calm yourself in a, in a really uncalm environment and really took that and, and applied it to farming. Cause I was in a really stressful, high pressure job for my age. So I did find myself, you know, getting quite anxious and stressed and worrying and, and all that sort of shit. So applied breath work to my farm, you know, that's just one example that I can give you so people understand, but yeah, obviously went through some really tough times in farming and got, you know, 
lost the love of it and got depressed. And when I go back to that situation, it was, it was actually the year after I retired from playing rugby. And when I go back and unpack it all, I don't know how familiar you are with farming, but we have for dairy farming, we have this winter period, which is, it's basically our cruisy time where the, the cows aren't milking, they're, they're dry. And so it's, it's, it's a relatively easy job. You know, you can, you can do all the fun jobs on farm, bit of fencing, you, you have to feed out a bit of feed to the cows, but there's generally not too many problems. You can relax a little bit, have a bit of time with the family or, or you know, it's typically when most farmers will have a winter holiday because it's easy to do. So we have this period where usually I'd be playing rugby and I'd be, you know, I'd be pretty bloody fit and strong. And the end of the rugby season usually can coincides with the start of springtime, which is carving on dairy farm. And that's full noise, bloody hard yakky. You know, we're doing massive hours. If you're in management or above and in, in farming, you're, you know, it's just chaos. It's literally chaos. You go from this winter period. And all of a sudden where you're doing not that much, you might do 50 hours a week sort of thing and, and just cruising along happy as and carving starts, cows start carving, you get all sorts of problems. Obviously we have to help them with carving. We get, you, know, you get a lot of animal health issues that you have to deal with. It's just full noise. Like you can, you can do a hundred hour week, no trouble. And it's, it's physically demanding. It's, it's the one, you know, three months of the year that's physically, you, you know, you got to pick up calves and chase them around the paddock sometimes. And you, you, you have to manhandle a lot of cows, you know, if they're crook, you, you physically have to roll them over and sit them up. And you know, it's just, it's long hours, it's physically demanding and it's very mentally demanding as well. And mm. I had, I retired from rugby and I, I, I had always been fit from rugby season so I could handle it. I could handle the physical aspect and that made the mental aspect easier to deal with. Retired from rugby and my first first winter off i put on 10 kilos visited a lot of cafes my wife wife was a, a keen baker so i oh mate i loved it i didn't have to go to footy training my weekends were free and just cruised and really enjoyed it and but put on 10 kilos in in a couple of months and got to carving in a week in just a week in just the start of it i knew i'd made a mistake because i was just physically buggered and I was like, shit, this is only just beginning. Like what's going on here? And I just knew instantly the difference between being fit and being unfit. And off the back of that mental fatigue set in really early, I started making bad decisions, stopped enjoying the job. Generally I'd for the most part, enjoyed the challenge of spring. You know, you have your days when you're like, fuck this, but you know, for the most part, yeah, I had a reasonably positive outlook on it, but yeah, found myself just getting negative and making bad decisions and just feeling buggered mentally and physically. And it was the first time I'd really encountered that to that level. So basically it yeah, spiraled down into a pretty bad place for over a couple of years and, and over the next few years managed to sort of get my way out of it eventually. And I sort of reflected back on it and thought, well, I, I saw the link between how it started and that was with physical fitness. And I thought, shit, there's a lot of farmers out there that aren't playing footy, you know, so I bet if I've gone through it and I thought I was a mentally strong positive person you know and i was like shit i bet there's a lot of other people out there that must struggle and i was like i bet you if they were fitter it would help their mental health as well and, and make them a better farmer they'd be a better farmer because of it. if they can physically handle the job and and have some tools through fitness then it would make a difference so i i decided i was like well why don't i just have a go at you know helping other people for a change because i would never really done anything like that in my life I'd, I'd received help from other people and i I guess I've had it, felt a sense that I didn't pay them back. So I thought, well, why not pay it forward? And, you know, there was a lot of people out there complaining about not just farmers, but there were, were a lot of farmers complaining about how hard spring was and how there wasn't enough support. And I was like, well, fuck it. Well, I've, I've got an idea that can help you. It's helped me. I understand it. I've got a pretty good experience with sport, sport and training. So I just put it out there to local community. I think it was 2019, summer of 2019. I think I did it before Christmas, actually. I'm looking at, you know, doing some trainings twice a week, just at home. And if anyone wanted to join in, I'd be more than welcome to accommodate them and, and help train them and get them fit. And I was expecting a couple of young fellas that were, that I'd talked to a little bit about rugby. They would I'd seen a little bit of myself and them that they weren't, weren't anything special on the rugby field, but they wanted to get better. And I was like, oh, I could probably help them. And I was, I didn't have the balls to actually go and say, oh, come and train with me, I'll help you. Cause I didn't want to put myself out there directly to them, yeah. but 
just sort of put it out there on a community page. And I think I had six people turn up the first night and yeah, different people than I thought would turn up, but yeah, sort of went through it and yeah, just kicked it off really. And before probably yeah, a few weeks later, I was getting sort of 10 or 12 people and they were really enjoying it. And yeah, just, just sort of grown from there and, and yeah, after about a month of doing these fucking like sort of boot camp style workouts on my driveway, I sort of thought, well, if, you know, these 10 people are really enjoying it and they're, they're getting some good feedback out of it. And I was like, wonder if we could inspire some other farmers around the country to do it. And that's when we actually started farm fit and we started an Instagram page first, I think, and, and just sort of started putting a little bit of. It was terrible content, but just started putting something out there, you know, and, and showing it off a bit. And I did a, you know, bit of my, started after a while putting in a little bit of sort of my personal mental sort of side of things, I guess. And I think I did, I think the first thing I did was jumped in a water trough as a, as a cold water sort of thing, therapy thing, just to, you know, introduce something different. Cause like most farmers would never have heard of that, you know, you know, taking a cold shower or a cold bath or an ice bath and that sort of thing. So just sort of did that as, you know, just started adding in little bits of that and the workouts and that, and it's just growing into a community and, and yes, like when I started, I was like, man, if I could inspire 500 people to, to get fit before carving and look after themselves a bit better and, and, and have a little bit of a dive into their mindset and their, how they handle pressure and stress and, you know, all those things you tend to do when you look after yourself. I mean, I was, I was like, man, that would be pretty bloody cool to, to be able to do that. And that's, that's what the goal was really just to get a few hundred people to be, feel inspired and feel empowered to look after themselves is because it's, you know, as farmers, and I'm sure it's the same in town as well, but you tend to look after everything else first and you come last and it's, it's particularly evident with farmers because we, we look after the cows first and the farm and, and they take up so much of our time and energy that there's nothing left at the end of the day. So yeah, that was the goal really. And it's, yes, yeah, led to particularly gone down more the mental side of things rather than the fitness side lately or the last year or so, um, because that's the biggest barrier. Most of the barriers we have are, are up in the yep. top two inches. So, uh, really gone down there and, and become a bit of a, I guess I've added more, more of the farming content in there and become a bit of a, uh, advocate, I guess, or, or a spokesman for, for farming as well on the side. And, and obviously we got the, got the book off the back of it, talking about it. Yeah. So it's, it's been a bit of a journey. It's not where I saw it going, but we're here. Yeah. Have you, have you got a bit of a vision for the future or just kind of, again, just playing it out and, and exploring options? I've, I've, I've absolutely been winging it, mate. And people have often asked me that question, particularly early on. I was like, no, I've got no vision, mate. I'm just, I'm just having a go, but I guess, yeah, I, I do want it to be a bit more, I definitely want to be able to add value better than what I'm doing. Like, cause at the moment it's just the odd random video or the odd fitness fucking tip here and yep. there. And I definitely want, want some sort of a platform that people can go to, to be a bit more of a one-stop shop, whether they want the, the mental side of it or the physical side, there's, there's a place they can go to where if they, if what I, what I say and how I do it resonates with them and, and I'm their type of guy that they can have a bit of one-stop shop where they can get some information, go through some programs, whether it's physical or mental and, and get some real value that'll, that'll make, make a real change. You know, a lot, I think a lot of what I've done so far has been more inspiration rather than having something that they can actually go through and be the change. I've been more the inspiration or the catalyst for change, which is absolutely awesome. Like I'm happy with that, but yeah, I guess the next step is, is to, to be able to really, really help them on an individual one-on-one -on -one sort of basis, I guess. Yeah. Epic bro. That's, that sounds still really got to make cool. that happen though. Like it's all good talking oh, yeah. about it, but yeah, we'll see what we can do over the next year or so. I'm sure you've got lots of ideas and I'm sure you've, you've had lots of advice on it as well already. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. well, many yeah. people saying, oh, you should do this. You should do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. As yeah. you were talking about ideas, well. ideas were sparking in my head. I was like, well, nah, just keep, keep it quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to, I want, firstly. That's really awesome. And it's awesome that you are inspiring people and, and things are going really, really well. 
Mate, that's really cool in, in regards to kind of what you're what you're hoping to build with it. I guess kind of one of the one of the themes that I that I'm interested in is like are there are there a certain type of people or a certain type of farmer that have like have picked up on your stuff and have, have run with it? Like are they in a certain place in their in their life or in their world where the stuff yeah. that you're talking about is is kind of they're ready to absorb? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I guess the the people that I have the most interaction with are the ones that are, I guess, on the journey or or have been through it as well and, and come out the other side. So they've they've been through those tough times, whether it's depression or, or just, just challenges in life. And they've come out the other side or, or those that are just just clicking onto that journey, I think. And yeah, that that's definitely the theme, and and you, and you get the odd one, and I think this is the these are the ones that you know really bring me satisfaction that they're in a shit place and they and they're not owning it, so to speak, and and they don't know what to do or where to go, and and they connect with FarmFit, and you know they watch the videos and and you know watch my daily life, so to speak, and and it and it gives them something and a, and a, and a few things click with them and, and, and I've been, I guess, well, FarmFit's been the, the catalyst for them, you know, owning their shit and, and taking responsibility and, and, and making the change, I guess, and, and working their way out of it. That's like hugely satisfying, you know, to, to, to be the messenger for that, I guess. And no matter like whatever environment you're in, whether you're a farmer or not, you know, the step, the problems we have are pretty much the same, just in a different environment, and 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 so is the way to work yourself out of it. And yeah, one of the big things for me was 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 just accepting where you are, like that acceptance of 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 not blaming others, and and you know once once I did that, accepted the 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 space I was in, whether it was you know physical, or mental, was I was there because I put myself there one way or another, whether you like it or not. It's it's generally through a succession of choices and and whatnot that we end up in that place you know once once you figure that out and accept that you can you can go about taking responsibility for it too and that was that's been hugely important for me and, and talking with others that have that have been there and, and back out again they've all you know echoed that you know self-acceptance and self-responsibility and and taking ownership of it and how important that is to do and, and yeah that was that was a big turning point for me and I I try and weave that into the content now that you know it's it's up to us you know no one's yeah you know as Goggins says no one's coming to save you you know yeah. you got to do it yourself it's it, it's massive and like a, there's a there's a saying and I'm going to butcher it as well it's <laughs> you you may not be responsible for where you are right now or it may not be your fault where you are right but it's your responsibility to make change yeah. moving forward. And I have butchered that, but that's, that's kind of the yeah. cut and thrust of it. And it's, it's it is. like, there's, there's always externalities that are going on and there's, there's a heap yeah. of farming in terms yeah. of, of things that, the, that aren't within your control, like there are in kind of many other areas as well, yeah. but actually it's your, it's your responsibility with kind of how you respond and how you move forward and how you build your skill set to cope with shit when it happens so that you can you can process it and you can make it through okay yeah 100 percent. and there's a, a great little way of framing that i i i found a little while ago ero they call it e r e plus r equals o and that is events plus reaction equals outcome and mm. i thought that was a really good way to to, to frame problems for people and and you know because you know the event is generally not in your control at all and and we get that a lot in farming i think that's why it's such a, a tough environment because a lot of the shit that happens to us a lot of our problems we have zero control over it so they just happen and you add into that your reaction to that and and that defines your outcome and i think what it's what i try and do now is is yeah you get the event and i try and think of the outcome before i react and it's it's trying to you know what is the idea that, you know, this shit things happen, you know, we're in a drought, whatever, or there's new regulations coming in or the payouts dropped, this events happened. What's the outcome that I want from this? What's the ideal outcome? And then from that, you can choose how you react to it. 
rather than I think, you know, most of us are, are born, you know, we're all born with just, you know, something happens and we react. And then we think about it later and we think, oh shit, shouldn't have done that or shouldn't have said that is mostly the mm. case when we're talking about personal relationships. You know, we often, <laughs> we often just, you know, someone says something and we react to it, you know, with, with just the full emotion without actually thinking, oh, they've said this, what's the outcome I want for, from this conflict or whatever, and, and then choosing how to react off that. And that's, that's been a cool little, you know, those three words have been really important to just be able to frame, frame the stuff that's out of our control. And yeah, you know, it works really well for relationships and whether it's your mate or your wife or whatever, but, but also just in general life and work, it's a, it's a, it's something you've got to, got to have a handle on it, you know, mm. and cause you know, the, the future is so whether you're a farmer or whether in town, it's going to be a little bit different, but it's all going to be the same. And there's a lot of uncertainty about what's life going to look like in 10 or 15 years, you know, and, and I guess being in the food sector, we can. As farmers, I can see a lot of things changing about how, what food we produce, but how we're allowed to produce it and, and how we get that to people. I can see massive change in that happening and it's, you know, that, that ball's already rolling down the road, but I guess, you know, for, for our mates in town, you guys, I guess, consuming the food, you probably haven't seen that ball start to roll down the hill yet because no. you're sort of at the other end of the you know, you're at the other end of the supply chain. We're at the start, I guess, and we're, we we're producing it. We're, the, we're definitely getting a lot of signaling and, and things happening around regulation and, and whatnot that's signaling some pretty big changes coming your guys way. So we'll, we'll let that ball roll on down to you guys, but <laughs> smack you know, us on the side of the end. <laughs> it, it is, it's going to be a bit of a shock. You know, it's, it's, I know there's a lot of farmers out there that are in a little bit of disbelief around, you know, the direction that's being, we're being pointed in and, you know, my, my message to them at the moment is, you know, we've got to accept that things are going to change. Mm. doesn't mean we have to agree with it, but if we accept that we can actually go about manipulating that direction better too, and, and bringing our perspective to it in a smarter way. And, you know, I, I can see this playing out in many different circumstances in life that you know, if you have an argument with someone, if or you had have a disagreement or a different point of view, if you can actually accept the accept what they're saying and understand it, you can counter it so much better. Mm. You know, and it's uh, and I think sometimes someone has a a different opinion to us, and we just poo poo it without understanding it, or or just say, "Oh, that's stupid or crazy," and yeah. dismiss it. And I think you've actually got to stop and, and, and understand it first before you, before you jump to that conclusion and, and you, you can actually argue against it then or, or whatever it may be. But yeah, yeah it's, it's an interesting, it's going to be quite interesting being a farmer over the next 10 to 15 years to see how it changes. And I'm, it's scary, but it's also exciting for me too, because it's, you know, change creates opportunity as well. And, you know, it's, it's, it's another challenge and I, I try and get you know, lately on farm fit, trying to get, get that mindset across to other farmers as well and get them to, to open up a little bit about it and be creative about the future rather than seeing it as a negative. Um, you know, it's definitely going to be challenging, but it doesn't have to be negative either. Cause when you think about things positively, you, you get creative and energized mm. by them as well. So that's, yeah, that's definitely, uh, definitely how I like to frame challenges in the future. Yeah. And I think. Like that, that E plus R equals O as well. It's a great one there. And one other that I'd add, like a layer that I'd add on top of that as well is often when we have that negative reaction, it's driven by a really strong emotional response that we have to the event. Yeah. And like, we can't control that emotional response. It's something that like we have it based on our past mm -hmm. experiences, our beliefs, our values, our worldview, our physiology to a certain extent as well, that triggers totally. that emotion at that point in time for us. And like, even if you're running an E plus R equals O framework, that em an emotional reaction still happens for you, oh, but totally, it's, yeah. it's just choosing, just recognizing, oh, hey, actually I'm experiencing an emotion here. Yeah. That's sweet. I'm, I'm human. That's pretty yeah. normal. And taking that moment, that couple of seconds to think about what outcome that you want before you mm. react, even though you're, you're having that emotional response. And I think often when you hear people kind of talking about the stuff and they talk about all of these frameworks, which, which really, really helpful for us, 
but sometimes they talk about them in a way that is like, oh, it's going to get rid of all your uncomfortable emotions. It's going to get rid of the pain that's associated with it. No, it doesn't. It just helps you process it a little bit better so that you can, you can choose a more helpful path going forward. Yeah. Yeah. And it is. And it, it's, it's, it's literally taking that, those two or three seconds and recognizing the emotion. Like I, as a fella, man, for, and I, I still struggle with it massively now, but I'm something I've worked on is, is naming an emotion or naming a feeling, but uh, yeah. I really struggle with it, man. Like I, I know I'm feeling something and I feel this, but what is it? Like what emotion is it? What feeling is it? Is it anger? Is it resentment? Is it, is it hate? Is it, you know, and, the, and I've found it quite difficult to put tags on it, you know, just to put the right language to, to what I'm feeling. But it's what I've tried to do is when you feel that is to stop and name it before you do anything with it. And, and it just gives you a bit of understanding of, of, you know, just a, a deeper level of, yeah, I'm feeling this right now and this is this. And, and then I ask myself, well, why? Yeah. You know, what's this telling me, you know, what, why am I angry about this? What's, what's got my back up about it or, or why am I sad about it or, you know, whatever it may be, what, why am I, why does this excite me? You know? And if you can understand those things, man, it, it changes the ball game a bit, I reckon, you know, yeah. it, it makes that ERO make, make sense. And it makes it a really powerful tool. I think once, if you can, yeah, like, like you said, like emotions and feelings happening, and I, I got them described to me as your emotions and feelings are driving the car and they're always going to be driving the car, but you can, you can engage the other side of your brain, the, you know, the logic side to give it directions and, and, you know, try and coax it to, to turn, take that corner, right. You know, you, you can't take over. We like to probably think we can, that our logical brain can take over and control our emotions and all that sort of shit, but it can't, but it's, you, you, you learn to catch them and, and, and talk to them and understand them and say, oh, actually, if we turn left here, there's, there's, there's a chocolate factory down there, <laughs> you. whatever it may be, but you know, you, you're always, you, your emotions yeah. are always driving the car. They're always in control. So it's. It's, it's a matter of talking to it, talking yeah. to your emotions, you know, and understanding it. And I think as, especially as, as Kiwi males, young Kiwi males, and I don't know if this is different now, but like we, we grew up, we're kind of in our mid to late thirties, you emotions were something that you never really talked about. Like you had mm. the, the teenage boy emotions that were acceptable to feel were happy, angry, tired, hungry, and horny. And yeah. they were the, they were the fives that you could, you could have. And like when you felt different ones to that, the, almost the kind of natural reaction is to try and repress them is to try to push them, yeah. or push them down or push them away. And that's, or numb them out with, with something else, with some kind of distraction, whether that's, yeah. whether that's drugs or drinking or scrolling on social media or working or kind of getting lost in something else as well and, and running away from those emotions which is never particularly helpful because they just kind of pile up pile up yeah. inside you and and spurt out at some other point in, in time <laughs> but like I've, I've wanted to kind of talk with you about about pain and about discomfort as well Kane and, and just kind of get your take on like learning to sit with that and learning to be okay. Cause I think like we live in a society at the moment where pain's demonized. The pain is a pain is a really, really bad thing. But again, like, just like emotions, we're human pain is pain is normal, whether that's kind of physical, mental or an emotion or emotional pain that we're experiencing. And like you, you talked about you have, you have had an experience of pain in your life on, on many occasions. When did you, when did you start to learn kind of how to sit with that and how to be okay with that? Yeah. So it's a, it's a tough one, eh? Because, I, you know, I, I did the typical things with pain as, as suppressed it as deep down as you could go. So I, you know, forgot about it almost to, to, mm. to a point, you know, you, you try and forget particularly trauma, I think you just 
you just shove it down there as far as it'll go, but you, you're dead on that it comes out sooner or later one way or another. It's not usually good. It's, it's like a freaking volcano erupting. And that's, that's never, you know, that's always destructive. It was really, you know, I can't give enough credit to the sport of boxing, you know, and that was really a point where I guess I'd suppressed pain for a long time or trauma in particular would have been, you know, eight or nine years probably I'd I'd just shoved it deep down and and you know the, the pain festered you know it was always there I, I guess I suppressed the trauma and the, and the 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 memories of it or tried to but that pain was always just beneath 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 the surface and it was always you know I always felt that pain and I never I didn't get comfortable with that until I found a way to get it out if that makes sense. And, mm. and I found a way to get it out through boxing and it was, um, you know, as horrible as it sound, it was really, it was really good to punch people in the face. Like it was, <laughs> it was fucking, it was such a, <laughs> it sounds horrible, but it was such a relief, you know, because, you know, it, and, you, and you'll know a teenage boy has so much testosterone and you add some pain into that and it's, you know, it comes out as aggression and hate and anger and, you know, they're, they're all normal things that we feel as teenagers. I'm sure even the, even the lasses do as well, but we all have shit that happens to us as a, as a child, you know, parent relationships, siblings, bullying, fucking you name it. There's, everyone has their shit and we're probably not always that aware of it until later on in life, but we all have something that causes us some, some angst. And man, when I, when I got into boxing and, and found a way to relieve some of that anger in a in a in a way that rewarded me i think was the important part because you know i could have just gone you know and had fights at school and or you know at the pub and got arrested and got in trouble and you know that wouldn't have been rewarding that would have been more pain but being able to do it in a in an environment where it was rewarded and safe i guess and and not frowned upon where you're encouraged to do it you know i think that was a, a really important part of it that reward of letting it out and and using that pain as a positive for for a positive use i think was extremely powerful and i guess over time through boxing i i knew that i was using that pain to get me through you know fights and and sparring and the training you know the hard training i'd i'd bring that pain up and and it would, for lack of a better term, put me into a bit of a beast mode, you know, where you're just in the zone and you're like, fuck yeah, I can do this, you know, and, and you achieve something you couldn't do before. And being rewarded for that, I guess I experimented with it and I was able to bring that pain more to the surface and, and I guess I, yeah, started thinking about it and, and sort of unpacking it you know unpacking that trauma and and you know so so yeah at first it was it was purely when i got into you know sparring with boxing that that anger side of me would come out I and mean, i learned to control it and through practice sparring you know you, you don't want to get too angry but it's handy once in a while to, to fire up a bit and when you get tired it, it gives you a bit more energy so i started using it and then then you take that into your training when you're doing your training runs or hitting the bag and that sort of thing. And, and then it just sort of morphed into, it would be something that I didn't, I guess I started repacking or unpacking that event again and, and allowing myself to think about it. I gave myself permission to think about it, you know, because I'd tried to forget about it for so many years. And that was, that was a, it was really tricky, really, really tricky, but you know, I just allowed myself to relive it, relive it and, and understand it and understand how I reacted off the back of it. And it started making sense for some of the, uh, you know, made sense for how I acted as a teenager in times and, and why I was like I was. And so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly thankful and it, it's still something I have to go back and unpack once in a while. Once in a while, I get triggered when I see something on the news about sexual abuse, man. Like I fucking, my jaw clenches, you know, and I, 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 I go back to that place of pain in it. But, you know, when you, when you, when you practice unpacking it and practice sitting with it, it gets easier, you know, and I, I don't know what I would have done if I never found boxing, to be honest, because I, I didn't, you can't, 
I guess rugby was a little bit of a release, but it wasn't the same. I, I never got that through through rugby. Well, I probably did a little bit, but not like I did. It wasn't as clear cut as as what I what I did through boxing, and it, it scares me a little bit to think how it would have come out if I didn't find boxing. Mm. I, I definitely had potential to be do bad things. I think I would say I don't know what that is necessarily, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely grateful. It's one of the one of the things I'm grateful for. You know, apart from my kids and family and that, I'm extremely grateful I found that sport and I've, I found a way to heal myself through it. I'd say would be would be a good term to use. Awesome, man. I'm I'm bloody glad you found boxing because it's really cool yeah. to be having a conversation with you here today and and kind of listening to all of your all of your learnings purely from a selfish perspective but i'm also glad for you <laughs> as well yeah mate it's funny like usually like when people ask me how far farm pit started i actually go back to to starting boxing because if i didn't do that i wouldn't have had the courage to or i wouldn't have learned about myself like i have now i wouldn't have had the courage to do this sort of thing you know so that's really when when farm fit was really started was was that journey way back then which was 17 18 years ago yeah so it's quite it's quite weird like that like yeah it's but it, we're hugely powerful yeah hugely powerful it's and really interesting to think about i guess is like what is stuff that you're doing today what ripple effect is that going to have in 17 years time like yeah totally. potentially like what is this conversation going to do for you or for me or for someone who's listening to it in 17 years time there's mm. just there's been maybe something is something's triggered some neural connections been made and then hopefully someone yep. hopefully some young kid who's listening to this conversation is like oh when i talk, heard chris and kane talk actually that was the start of my journey so, yeah yeah it, and i tell you what, what what was super rewarding was going back and writing the book because it's it's it, as you're you're finding reading it's, it's sort of a biography basically mm. and it's and i've had to go back through my life and look retrospectively and it's like looking back things have actually lined up and they've made sense. Yeah. And it's been, I, I have never stopped to do that. I've never stopped to go back through our, through my life and just, you know, look at all the things that have happened and, and where they've led to, because at the time, man, it seems real shit. Like mm. none of this stuff that I'm doing now, this conversation wouldn't be happening without the bad shit that's happened, you know, and the tough times and the challenges and the, the times you wanted to quit give up and fucking you know just just quit on life you know and and they're the moments in my life when i look back now when you join the dots you know they're the dots that you join together that have led me to here and you know sometimes i get a bit scared like what are the next dots going to be you know what <laughs> how bad are they going to be but you know it's, it's so interesting when yeah writing the book it was just it was really cathartic to go back and you know a lot of my life sort of made a bit more sense you know mm. you know it was, it was pretty cool to look back and as going through that process has that made you more positive about the future where you see actually hey like here's these here's these un, like these bad dots that have lined up but they've been part of this kind of bigger puzzle that or the bigger connect the dot yeah. thing that i'm working on and that's led me to here so i've got that capacity totally. to cope with hard shit and in, in the future yeah, absolutely, man. And it's, it's, yeah, it absolutely has it. I'm, I'm more, I guess, I guess a way to look at it is I see the storms for what they are as storms and, mm. and I know that they won't last. It's, it's really given me that understanding that they, storms come and go, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, whether you're on the Arctic or, or up on a mountain, it, it's not stormy all the time, you know, and these things sweep into our lives with no warning and they cause absolute havoc and, and it, it's horrible to be in it, but they do sweep through and, and there's, there's, you know, you can keep traveling on your, on your journey afterwards. And yeah, it definitely, definitely clarifies that, that, you know, there's positives and the negatives, you know, they all, they balance each other out, you know, and it's, yeah, it's definitely, definitely clarified that for me that, you know, whatever, whatever comes I can, I can cope with too, you know, that there's. I, I can take on whatever comes and I know I'll be okay. It, it won't be easy, but I know I'll be okay yeah. at the end of it. Kane, mate, 
I think we're going to have to do a round two, mate. Like there's still a lot of stuff that we could have a conversation about, but it's the time is getting on a little bit this evening. I've heard my, my two-year-old wake up about three times already. So I'd better go <laughs> tag my wife out. But mate, if people want to follow you, if they want to, to grab the book, how can they do that? Yep. So I'm on Facebook and Instagram, Farm Fit NZ. I think you'll, you'll find me on either of those pretty easy and, and the book tools for the top paddock. It will actually be in my, I've got a shop as well, where I sell a bit of merchandise will be in my shop on the website, which will be a link through Instagram and Facebook, but it should be in any good bookstore, paper, paper plus, what calls warehouse, or you can buy it direct from me. So you've yeah, been bloody humbled by the response for that. So in the yeah, by all accounts, everyone's enjoyed it from what I've heard. So yeah, mate, you'll, you'll find me if you want to, is the, is the, is the main <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Okay. Before we finish up, mate, I got a couple of other questions, quick questions for you. Well, potentially yeah. quick, potentially quite long. How do you like today how do you build your capacity for doing hard things yeah yeah I, i'm fucking stoked to use that word capacity mate because that's that's super important i i often think about you know resilience gets bantied around a lot mm. and it's a word that gets talked about a lot that we need it i like to replace resilience with capacity because i think that's what really resilience is if, if, if we're resilient we've got capacity to take things on so yeah great 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 use of wording there but basically it, it comes to me as uh, i've got a, gotten really good at putting a filter on what comes into my life so letting go of the uncontrollables would be the main one i think you know taking in what you can control and, and filtering out what you can't control or what doesn't matter as the case may be sometimes you know there's a lot of noise out there you don't have to listen to it all is what i'm getting at particularly social media and what you see and hear on the news or from friends and family you don't have to take that all in you, you got to be able to filter some of that shit out big one for me has been dealing with the things that do come into your life not not suppressing those emotions and problems and and shoving them to the side is actually facing up to them and and working through them because that you know they add they add stress to your life, you know, so you gotta, you gotta deal with them when they come in and not let them fester and, and shove them down. And then, you know, I, I try and have work into my day, something that, you know, I, I like to think of the capacity as like water in a bucket. So keeping some space at the top of my bucket, I, I like to take some water out of my bucket by, you know, essentially putting it into the old happiness cup, if you, if you want to call it that, and, you know, and that, that can be through gratitude. It can be through movement, can be do you know, a chat like this for me takes water out of my bucket because I'm having a, a, a conversation that's engaging and energizing and, and, you know, it's good quality, you know, so that, that for me is a, a, a positive thing in my life. So there's a range of things, but I just try and do one a day that whether it's a workout, whether it's, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll just spend 10 minutes in the paddock with the cows, just appreciating them and, and, or, you know, a bit of time in nature, just to appreciate the beauty you call that gratefulness or whatever, gratitude, something like that. To, so I've got sort of, you know, a, a base covered in either way to, to, to keep that capacity. And, but, but overall, I think, mate, just being aware, aware if you've got capacity and how much is a, is a, is a really good first step. Being aware of what capacity you've got is a, is super important. Yeah. And Briscoe, thank you so much for getting uncomfortable with me today, mate. <laughs> my absolute pleasure mate thank you so much for getting uncomfortable with us today i always love these conversations if you want to have a hear a guest if you want to have a topic explored if you want to ask a question please send an email to chris at healthmentors.nz uh, and we can get onto that for you if you want to support the show, the best way that you can do that is subscribe on your favorite podcast app and make sure to share it out with some of your mates as well. Thank you to Health Mentors, the sponsor of the show today. If you want to improve your health and your performance in the middle of a chaotic world, make sure to check out healthmentors.nz or send an email to chris at healthmentors.nz for a no obligation chat. Thank you so much to my brother Jeremy Desmond for the amazing theme music to the show. And thank you to you guys for tuning in and listening all the way to the end. We'll see you all again next week.